Okay, this just draws your attention to another crop that doesn't have much sex, but has a huge, huge impact in the world. We're used to thinking of bananas as something you have with dessert. Uh, in fact, bananas are the principal food source, source for about three or 400 million people in the world. Uh, bananas and related musa species, which are plantain or cooking bananas. Um, features about bananas, as you know from having never crunched your tooth on a banana seed, is that they are sterile and they're triploid. And every banana almost any of you have ever eaten is exactly the same as every other one that any of you has eaten. They're all cloned. Basically, every banana produced and sold in basically the industrialized world, or produced elsewhere and sold in the industrialized world, is one variety called Cavendish. And they're all a clone of each other. So talk about genetic vulnerability. What's also interesting about that is in developing monocultures like that, they've also had to practice environmental homogenization to optimize for the performance of that monoculture. So in every banana producing country, there are vast problems with environmental degradation due to excessive pesticide usage uh, and excessive irrigation problems because they have never been able to adapt sensibly uh, banana cultivation to local environmental conditions or local social conditions. Consequently, the, the room for improvement in banana is staggering. Uh, problem is sterile triploid. How do you possibly improve it? Well, you have to improve it by going back to the parental uh, types that originally gave rise to this, and we don't know what they are. So how can we find that out? Um, as you'll see, um, it's going to be using a new technique that hasn't been published yet based on PCR, invented by uh, Mark Zabo at Keygene in Holland called AFLPs. Um, first, I want to bring into it another tropical crop as an example of how complex it can all get, where we can make inroads very quickly. This is cassava. Um, much of Africa, including, for instance, Rwanda, uh, depends on cassava as their principal source of uh, calories and carbohydrate. This is the cassava root system. Uh, it's a very, very robust crop. You can find, uh, if you leave cassava in the ground for a year, you can still harvest it, even after cutting the tops off. And in Mozambique, this was essential for keeping survival of small communities during the uh, Civil War, because if you planted cassava, it was a fail-safe crop. You could top the thing so you couldn't even see it from above. Rebels could come through, destroy the, the community. You go back afterwards, dig up your cassava, you could feed your family. Uh, it's an extremely important crop. But again, this has a problem that it's highly heterozygous and planted as a vegetative cutting of large pieces of the stem. In fact, that, for instance, would be a, a, a propagule, a planting stock for cassava. Well, if your planting stock is that big and it's vegetative, it carries disease with it when you plant it. And because it's large, it doesn't go a long distance. You don't take a sack of 50,000 of these like you would take a handful of 50,000 seeds of tomato. Okay, so the problem is there's very, very limited distribution of the genetic diversity of cassava because here in Africa, this was taken in Zimbabwe, here in Africa, uh, cassava is not indigenous. Cassava was imported to Africa about 300 years ago, three, 400 years ago, in very limited amounts, which means that the founder population of the breeding, of the breeding stock in cassava was very, very narrow. So this is why this, this is why I get to thank Perkin Elmer not only for inviting me here, but for providing one of the least informative slides on Earth. Uh, this is a technique called AFLP, um, Amplified fragment -like Polymorphisms. I want to give Bruno some credit here. You know, some people call RFLPs riff lips, and he was strongly arguing that PCR-based link polymorphisms really should be called pucker lips. Um, <laughs> um, it's certainly a, a good idea, I think. Um, nonetheless, the basic concept of AFLP is to use the, the scanning mechanism of RFLP. That is, you're sampling for variation in a restriction site. Well, in RFLPs, that's enormously powerful, but are basically archaic technique. Um, what's happening is you get 50, 60, 70,000 potential candidate bands you'd like to look at, and what do you do? You look at one at a time by probing. I mean, this is really, really dinosaur stuff. I mean, Svante couldn't get amplification from this concept. Um, what we have here with AFLPs is an idea that Mark Zabo said, well, hey, if we've got a ton of information in that smear, why don't we, instead of sampling one or two, why don't we sample 1,000 and do a barcode? And the concept was simple. Take uh, a fixed, a fixed uh, primer cut with a, a sticky in fragment, uh, ligate on a fixed size and fixed sequence primer of, say, or sorry, oligo of about 20 base pairs. Okay, once you do that, then what you do is you amplify with primers corresponding to that, but with a certain degree of degeneracy in, which will then select from amongst the 10 or 20 or 50,000 fragments on the gel that subset that actually has matching at the three prime end. So what ends up happening is you develop a technique where you can generate barcodes of as many or as few bands as you wish. And from one amplified population, you can probe again and again and again to get countless different barcodes based on the degree of degeneracy of your three prime end. It's a beautiful concept.
and it, it basically blows out any arbitrarily prime method I've seen or RFLPs completely out of the water. They haven't published this yet, and a little bit of pride, I should say, this was developed by people in agriculture. So read your plant stuff, folks. Um, well, read your plant patents. Um, this is an example of how this can be automated extremely well. This is in the early alpha stage at Perkin Elmer, I'm told, uh, but still nonetheless running it through a 373A uh, with optimized software, which is in the process of being worked up, one should be able to generate unambiguous high throughput barcodes and capillary electrophoresis becomes common. I anticipate virtually no human intervention in the process other than the making of the template DNA uh, will be necessary. So this technology is very, very powerful to generate what amounts to patterning information. Uh, for forensics, obviously, this has big implications. But for plant breeding uh, and for agricultural enhancements, it's really interesting. Because if we're looking at the cassava story, let's go back and say, if the African community is having trouble breeding for improved cassava because they don't have the genetic diversity, how can we import the uh, important founder populations? Now, cassava evolved around somewhere in the Amazon, or mostly in Brazil. In that part of Brazil, there are countless small farms called Rosas, where these farmers have been selecting from the indigenous germplasm for high-performing varieties, high-performing in their complex systems. Now, that's done from a terrific founder population. They can choose from almost anything. So consequently, we have hundreds of years of empirical but highly tuned selective breeding for improved cassava varieties in complex systems. What we want to do now is use the power of AFLPs and what amounts to uh, genomic patterning information, where we don't even have to have a map necessarily. We need patterns and pedigree patterns. Say, let's talk to the farmers, or let's not us, because of course I don't speak Portuguese, but Bruno does. So let him and sociologists talk to the farmers and say, what do you like about this variety? What's interesting about it? And assign a set of dynamic descriptors and associate that with genomic patterning information. Going back to the many species that have given rise to the Manihot complex, find what are the progenitors that are likely to give rise to that information in a breeding scheme in Africa and then provide that to the African breeding community. And I think what you'll see is that the small farmers then can get a huge impact out of genomic patterning information simply by coupling it to listening to farmers. Now, this is an example of one of the other very important aspects of PCR that's going to apply to plants very heavily. Unlike us, things get bad, we can't, I mean, we can, we can get out of here. Plants can't, so they have an extremely responsive gene expression system that. Uh, basically, if there's a house plant in this room, it's probably got more activity in terms of its gene expression than any of us here. Um, it has to adapt. As soon as somebody walks by, gene expression changes dramatically. If you wound it, it changes very dramatically. There's basically very little physiological homeostasis compared to what you've got in mammals. So what happens is that in terms of PCR-based information, information about changes in gene expression may be one of the most important contributions rather than gene structure or gene organization. This is an example of um, basically RNA-mediated arbitrarily primed PCR, or RAP PCR, that was developed by Mike McClellan and John Welsh. Mike actually gave me this slide which shows two different cell lines responding to different uh, environmental cues, in this case hormones, and using RNA as a, uh, as a template, after obviously a cDNA uh, step, he was able to find discrete bands that correspond to different environmental cues messenger RNAs that are associated with environmental cues of either hormone treatment or time, or in this case, cyclohexamide blockage of secondary effects of the hormone. Uh, you have here a message, for instance, that decreases with time. We're talking a few hours here. This kind of information is very important for plant biology and extremely difficult to obtain by non-PCR-based methods. So this is a very, very new method, and Mike has a review of, of uh, the CIBR version of this method in the, the copy of the, the magazine that was made freely available at the beginning of the meeting. So this RAP PCR is going to be very important, and I really look forward to tomorrow's talk about more technical details on it.